All right, welcome back to a tech debacle. I had to buy some stuff because my computer has been dying a slow, painful death, which I've basically attributed down to something with motherboard voltages, VRMs. Uh, everything will run at their base settings, but like the RAM won't run at its XMP settings. If I try and the turbo boost doesn't boost up to what it's supposed to, it's just, it's not doing its, its goodness anymore. So I had to order some stuff. This time around, I'm going Intel. I don't know why, I just thought it would be a good idea because my last several computers have been all AMD based systems. Don't get me wrong, I like AMD. I've been not necessarily a fanboy, but I've been a fan of AMD, at least trying to shake up Intel since like back in the, the AMD K5 chips. It was before the, the i-series and the core duos came out, but that's back in college days. That's back, back when I was a youngin. These days we're going with some new stuff. So we got a 13th gen core i5. Why did I go with the i5? Because most of the video editing that we do uses the graphics card. So the graphics card is technically more important than the CPU, which I found out with my last build. On that one, I went from using the free version, which was CPU heavy, to using the studio version, which was GPU intensive, and found out that I'd overspent on my CPU. Oh well. Anyway, this is the Core i5 13600K. Uh, if I remember the stuff correctly, it is 6P cores and 8E cores, so it's a 14 core um, processor. Uh, now, to go along with that, I bought one of these. This is from Thermaltake, and basically it is just a uh, CPU holding bracket. Because apparently the 12th and 13th gen CPUs have uh, some issues with the CPU bending after a while in the regular lever bracket. Apparently it's more common with the i7s and the i9s. More core counts, higher heat probably. But I figured since this was right on the edge of i5, i7, and also this is the version that has the uh, onboard Intel graphics, so hopefully that'll help out a little with video editing. Um, I figured I'd be safe and go ahead and get one of those. Now, this just a fan hub controller. I didn't know if I was going to need it because technically with my new cooler, I'm going to be reducing the number of fans in my case because right now I have an AIO and on the radiator for it, I have four fans, two on each side and a push-pull configuration. These things I have found with the last couple things I've built, the Noctua, well, I mean, Noctua is just great right out of the gate, but these D9Ls, and I've heard the, I think it's the U12 versions, really kind of punch above their weight with their cooling abilities. So um, I've got that. Let me see if this is the configuration I think it is. I think it's two fin towers with a fan in the center. I'm, I swear this opens somehow. There we go. So yes, I was right. This is uh, two fin stacks with a fan in the center, pulling through one and pushing through the other. So that might be some of the reason as to why these seem to cool so good for their size is it's basically two heat sinks with one fan pulling through it. Now, just in case, didn't know if I needed it, but I got an extra one of these fans. If I need to try and clip one on the back end of it and do a little extra push, we can do that. Now, we're stepping up to DDR5. Now, these kits, I did a little looking. For some reason, looking around, a lot of the DDR5 kits that are being advertised, being pushed, uh, when you look at the kits, are like CL36 and CL40. Now, obviously, the higher the mega transfers per second get, when you start talking your 6,000, 7,000, 8,000 mega transfers per second, your cast latency or your CL rating is going to get higher as well because you need more latency to run that fast to make sure that your stuff doesn't run over itself. However, if you go a little bit lower, this is, I think, a 5600 kit. You do a little bit of digging. This is a CL28. There was also a CL30 kit I was looking at, but they were only like 3 or $4 different, so I went with the 28. So 64 gigs of DDR5 5600 CL28 tight latencies as long as they don't incur RAM errors are better because that's just less latency in what you're working on. 
Now, as an interesting note on this, because I looked this up, according to G-Skill, this kit is rated to work with this motherboard. They also had a dual channel, two stick, 96 gig kit. It was two 48 gig sticks. I did not know they made 48 gig sticks in DDR5. Actually, I didn't know they made it in DDR4 either, but... And that is also rated for this motherboard. Now, that was CL40, but there you're getting down to chip density on the uh, silicon, again, requiring more latency to make sure it doesn't uh, cause memory errors. But I found it interesting. I seriously thought about buying that, but it was about $100 more than this kit. And I figured 64 gigs is enough. Really? Time Tech which is a storage company that I had never heard of before about a year or two ago. Um, I've used one or two of their SATA SSDs. I've had no problems with it so far. I went out on a limb and bought these because uh, uh, Prime Day sale. These two gig DRAM cache M.2s were rated for, I think, 7,000 megabytes a second. They've got a DRAM cache, so they're not running SLC or system RAM buffers. And they were like 65, 68 bucks, something like that each for two terabytes. Figured I'd give it a try. I'd replace my older drives. If I'm upgrading, I might as well upgrade. And now down to the piece de resistance for this particular upgrade. The motherboard. I looked for some specific things in a motherboard. Now, believe it or not, due to the fact that I already have a case... I was looking for more of a MATX board, but I couldn't find one with the options I wanted, but I found one in ITX. So the only thing I'm really ending up losing on this one is a secondary PCIe slot. If I wanted to put in a second graphics card or something later, you know, after another upgrade or something. But on the other side of it, it is a Thunderbolt board. So it has two Thunderbolt ports. So if I wanted to get one of those external GPU enclosures that runs off Thunderbolt, I could do that. But this is the ASRock Z790 PG ITX TB4. Sounds more like a serial number than anything. Biggest thing about this board that I wanted has three M.2 slots on board. I didn't want to have to use any add-in cards, any of that stuff. Oh, also two and a half gig LAN on board. I couldn't find one with built-in 10 gig, at least not on a consumer level. I had to go to like a workstation or a server level board for that, and I didn't want to go go that route. But this does have onboard 2.5, so I don't have to have a slot to plug that card in. It has onboard display port and HDMI, so if I needed to use the onboard graphics, I could. Obviously several, what's the one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, USB 3.2 ports, two Thunderbolt ports, and then like I said, the onboard M.2 slots. So let's crack into this thing. Let's get going. I have not opened this up yet. This is a, a brand new thing even for me. So I'm gonna turn this little light on here. So I'm gonna have that over here. This is so that I can highlight stuff. Oh, also, as always, I have my favorite thermal paste, Cryonaut. I got a big old tube of this last time I bought some. So I should be good to go with that. Anyway, let's crack into the stuff here. What's this? This is a tiny little board. <laughs> I mean, I knew it was small, it's an ITX board, but great googly mook. So that's probably one of the M.2 slots, three SATA ports. There's a front panel USB-C, USB-3 panel. There's some fan headers up here. That is, that is tiny. Compact. All right. First thing, let's break out my uh, off-brand iFixit kit. What do we got in here? It's some screws. It's another M.2 screw. Thermal pad of some sort. Oh, that's the antenna. Some cable straps. I'm glad they send those with it. There's an M.2 screw for every M.2 slot. That's nice of them. Some SATA ports and looks like another thing of thermal pad. All right, so now also a quick look. I'm going to turn the little bad boy over. And there's our other two drive spots there. So they're on the back of the board. Not my particular favorite, but you take what you can get. I guess while I'm thinking about it. Now, one of these I already opened because I needed to make sure I got all my stuff off my big drive. And you know, that can take a while to copy stuff over, so... so I'm going to do that one on this side. Theoretically, these 
slots shouldn't be any different from each other. They should all be PCIe 4.0 slots, but I have this thing in my mind that the closer it is to the CPU, the faster it'll be. So the stuff drive that's just there for random files and my VM virtual disks and stuff that doesn't need any sort of high throughput, we will put that on the one that's further away. Not that it can be that much further away on an ITX board. And then the one that's gonna be for the cache drive. Oh yeah, the other reason I bought this is because while this is still rated for like 7,000 megabytes a second or whatever it is. What I was looking at that impressed me was the terabytes written option. So, you know, SSDs, you, got, you have either the mean time to failure, which is more of a platter hard drive rating method. And then you got the terabytes written rating. And these, the math is pretty easy since they're two terabyte drives and they have a 2000 terabyte write limit you can literally write the whole drive a thousand times over before it's supposed to fail. So that's pretty good. I'm not really gonna argue with that. Let's we'll slide that one in here. Get in there. There we go. All right, there we are viewers. Two drives. All right, so back to the front. All right. On one hand, I gotta get this out, but on the other hand, I don't wanna do a Linus and just drop it on the floor. <laughs> All right, now which way is which? Ah, okay, the notches line up differently. There we go, there we go. I was wondering, I was looking for my, I'm used to my little gold triangle. There we go. So now we got that in place. So that should just drop into place. And then we reuse the stock mounting screws. Always important to remember people, this is not car parts. You don't tighten it until it's snug and then do like a half turn. Tighten it until it's finger tight and then you do like maybe like maybe a quarter turn, unless you're doing something like a thread ripper socket where it literally has a little torque meter. But even then you're doing in like inch pounds, not foot pounds. You just wanna make sure you got solid, even coverage on the socket. So there we go. That is now in place. All right, so now we got the CPU in place. I am going to slot my boot drive in here. Now, I am going to attempt to transfer my boot drive from one computer to another. This does sometimes work. Now, I'm going from AMD to Intel, so there's a question of a bunch of drivers, but I've seen it done because Windows at least these days, is smart enough to detect a hardware change and go to generalized drivers and allow you to boot up and then reinstall the correct drivers. However, I've also seen it not go so smoothly. So fortunately, the only application I have installed that I had to worry about a license key was my DaVinci Resolve. So I've unlicensed that. So if all goes well, I'll boot it in. It'll say, hey, there's new hardware. Give me some drivers. I'll give it some drivers and we'll be good to go. That does open the problem for driver incompatibilities up later on, I understand that, but I don't wanna reinstall all my crap. And that's on the honest truth on that one. That's why most people don't do a clean install. They just don't wanna reinstall all their crap. Get that reinstalled before we go to, oh yeah, by the way, this CPU cover stuff, Keep that, because if you've got to send your motherboard back, they generally want that. Otherwise, they may not uh, honor your warranty. Now, let's look at this real quick, because there's a mounting thing that goes with that. Oh, and I've got my light sitting on it. This, I do not have a CPU spreader, which, by the way, I do find kind of funny, 
because back in the day, back in the day, we used to spread the CPU out before we put the cooler on because you wanted to manually make sure that that coverage was as thin as possible because metal to metal contact is gonna run faster or at least back then because the thermal compound wasn't as good but you wanted, if possible, metal to metal contact and the CPU paste was just to fill in the, the leveling for the machining on the top of the IHS and the bottom of the heat plate on the CPU cooler these days, A, we have much better CPU paste, but, you know, for the longest time, they were just like, put a gob of it in the center of the chip, screw your uh, CPU cooler down, and between the tension of the cooler and the heat of the CPU, let physics take effect and it'll spread itself out. With these new coolers where they're getting, they're not as square, they're getting longer, or the you get like the, the Threadripper or the Xeon chips, and they're, they're, they're big. Now they're starting to tell you to spread stuff out again. Eh, there's nothing new. Let me find my mounting kit here. All right, so I had to take a minute and read the manual because apparently they've changed this since the last time I did one of these. So you got your back plate. It'll tell you which color, because they're color-coded, package of nuts and screws you need. So you take the back plate, this particular one, because it's for the 1700 chipset, you get your screws in the right position, and then they have these little lock um, spacers that you put on them, and the spacer goes between the back plate, the side that says this side toward motherboard, and the motherboard. So now, I should be able to just drop this in place, boom, and turn this back over. I'm gonna turn it this way, because now I need to put the CPU paste on. There we go, all right. I also don't want the CPU paste to be sitting out in the air for like a super long period of time, so I need to make sure I've got my stuff oriented the right way. So now the pan's going this way, or that way, one way or the other, doesn't matter. I'll figure it out. Plastic spacers go on. I'm getting it. All right, so where's my thermal paste? That. Oh, I feel weird putting so much CPU paste on here. All right, let's use my little homemade spreader here, or home located spreader. All right, this is hurting my soul a little bit. I am not good at trying to do this without getting thermal paste all over me. Fortunately, this is the cryonaut, not the conductonaut, so I don't have to worry about anything being, you know, uh, electrically conductive. All right, let's put this back on and grab this. Now, that's gonna be the back of the case. I'm gonna push the air that way. Fortunately, Noctua generally labels its fans so we know it's going that way, so I want that sitting there. All right, so my battery is dying on my main camera here, so I gotta catch up here real quick. Um, it took me a minute to figure this out. You put the back plate in, you put the plastic washers down, you orient your brackets. Those have screws that go on top of those. Then you take the fan out. I don't know why I was trying to do it with the fan in. You take the fan out use the provided long low screwdriver to uh, tighten up the mounting brackets. See, now we're good and, good and attached. Uh, and then you put the fan back in. Let's see, we got uh, one last major component here to install, the old RAM. Everybody has their favorite brands of RAM and then, or their preferred brands of RAM. And then there's just the ones that you usually wind up getting. Some people like the Corsair, like the Vengeance RGBs and whatnot. I somehow almost always wind up getting the G-Skills. There we are. Because of compatibility and price. And honestly, that's the number one thing. If it works and you can afford it, it's probably the best thing you can get. There we go. All right. So 
I'm going to plug my fan in here. And uh, I guess the next part is just taking the uh, old board out and slapping this in and seeing if it starts up. I'm going to do a little work, probably do most of the swap out, and then uh, I'll see you guys later to make sure that it works. All right, so I have done some work on the computer here, uh, and I'm going to show you what I've done that wasn't according to plan so that I can uh, get this hooked up and see if this all worked. So here we go. All right, break up my little flashlight here. So I did remove my uh, my AIO cooler here because I went with the fans on that one. So I got two Noctua fans up, up in the front instead of four doing the push pull through the radiator. As you can see, I got some, or you might be able to see, I've got some cables left over because this board only required one eight pin power supply. It's probably all black, can't see any of that. Uh, let's see here, what else we got? Got the video card reinstalled, all the front panel connectors. Uh, it's only got one USB type C port on the board and only one USB three port, so I couldn't uh, steal any of the bits. But uh, one of the more important bits here is this. So I'm glad I bought this. Get my camera, over, my light over here. That is a uh, fan hub, because uh, I've only got apparently like two fan headers on the board for the chassis. So I've got that pinned over here. You got power from the SATA cable on the back. Uh, it takes a pin that goes into the chassis fan slot on the board. Uh, apparently you have to make sure you have a PWM fan plugged in the number one spot. Uh, and then I've got the two on the front connected together and hooked up here because cables aren't quite long enough. And I got an extender on the case fan in the back. This thing, which I have actually flipped around because before I had, it was pulling air from this side, going over, mixing with the air from here over the chipset, and then being pulled through the radiator out the front. Now we're going more in the classic direction. We're going from front to back. So now I gotta plug everything back into place and see if it works. All right, so the good news, everything is plugged up. And although if you look at this, isn't it cute? There's a little tiny motherboard and like 30% of the graphics cards hanging off the end of the motherboard and there's all this empty space around it. It's so cute. Anyway, everything's plugged in. It does work. I've got it to turn on. I've updated the BIOS, all that, uh, all that good stuff. Bad news is it will not read my boot disk from my old computer. This is probably because when I set the old computer up, I had the AMD RAID mode turned on because I had uh, two disks I was striping together for a, uh, a cache drive and I think it created like a JBOD container on the boot disk. So it sees that the disk is installed, but it says there's no bootable partition on it. So boo, I've got to reinstall Windows 11. So I'm not doing a tutorial on how to install Windows 11. Pretty much everybody knows how to do that. Once I get that done, I get to reinstall all of my stuff. Uh, if anybody really cares, drop a line below and let me know if you want to see any benchmarks or anything. But uh, for the most part, yeah, my computer has been updated. As soon as I get the OS reinstalled, I can get back to editing videos on here. Yay! So, like, subscribe, do the internet stuff. Leave us a comment below if you like, and uh, we'll see y'all next time. I've got enough friends in low places, baby.